Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. Now, today we are going to explore a story that I find incredibly inspiring, and I hope you do too. Uh, Now, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, attending a wonderful um, event in Fairlight called Soil to Stomach, and the keynote speaker was Charlie Massey, who uh, has written a wonderful book called The Call of the Reed Warbler, and Charlie was the keynote speaker. Uh, And emceeing the event was another guest on this podcast, Charlie Arnott, and uh, then at the end of the evening, there was a panel discussion and I was privileged to be on that panel with Charlie Massey and uh, and a few a few other people including my guest today Murray Pryor. Now Murray has an incredible story to tell of a uh, move from corporate the corporate world onto the farm and even though I started this program with an acknowledgement to country and uh, acknowledging the true custodians of this land Murray has taken it a step further. I won't spoil it for you. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Murray Pryor. Welcome to the show, Murray. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Murray, we met a few weeks ago at that wonderful evening Soil to Stomach that was organised out at Fairlight, the Fairlight Butcher, and it was great. Um, There was such so many great people on there and... uh, and you were one of them that I had the pleasure of meeting and you told this incredible story which I, I wanted to share with uh, our listener and uh, I wondered if you might tell us what's happened. Tell us a little bit about your journey from the corporate world to where you find yourself now. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been in law firms uh, for, for about 20-odd years um, working on the, the corporate side of the, the business and um it's been a terrific career in the sense of you know I've 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 travelled the world and I've you know enjoyed um, the opportunity to meet a lot of interesting people and and uh, uh, clients and and all of those sorts of things. But I guess in that entire sort of journey of engaging with all of those sorts of things, I started to become quite restless. Um, I had this sort of yearning or sense that. I must surely be on this earth to do more than just this this corporate type of job, um, and and that was something that kind of gnawed away at me as a bit of a dull ache um, to use to use a dentist, <laughs> um, and 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 I guess you know that kind of for us that my, me and my family that manifested itself in the search for for a farm to to be able to uh, move on to to land and to be able to. Um, it, I guess, you know, I've done a bit of my own sort of development and thinking on this, and I, it's it's partly about wanting to ex- have a, a something to express myself on where I can find my voice and I can find uh, within the landscape something that I can apply myself to and our family can 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 apply themselves and we can we can sort of, you know, cre- create. It's, it's a very cr- sort of creative pursuit. Um, and so we, but three years ago, we we uh, we did the classics sell up and move out. And I've still got the photo of crossing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for the last time. And we've bought a it, farm. It's still there, Murray. So <laughs> if you want to come back over, you can. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so our farm is located, um, if you draw a triangle between Goulburn, Canberra and Yass, we're right in the middle of, the, of that tri- triangle. It's a 220-acre diversified cattle uh, operation uh, where we, 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 um, we are a biodynamic farm. So, so that means that we are you know, sort of creating a lot of our own uh, inputs for that farm. We're farming with nature. Um, it's it's obviously chemical free. Um, it's a pristine landscape. Um, but like a lot of agricultural land in Australia, it requires quite a deal of healing. And so, when we bought the farm, I obviously I, I knew nothing about farming. And so I got given a book by Charlie Massey called Call of the Reed Warbler, which your listeners, some of whom might be familiar with, and. 
and that was a that was a, a life changing moment. That book really shook us to the core because it it basically everything I had in mind. Charlie said, "Don't do that," <laughs> and 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 that was that was very powerful. And and I kind of panicked at that point and thought, "My God, we're in over our heads now." Um, so I I did a bit of research and I found that Charlie had a um, had a, a part time seat at the ANU, which is not far from where we are. And so I called him up and I said, "I'm in some trouble here. I've bought a farm and I need your help. I've just read your book." Anyway, to cut a long story short, he came. Um, on board with us for about a period of six months, and I spent a lot of amazing time with 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 you know quite an amazing man, um, and he really kind of set us on a path um, which which you know has really changed our lives, um, and that kind of brings us up to the current day. That's kind of our our journey in a nutshell. And your farm, the history of that farm, was not biodynamic. Not at all, no. So obviously, pre-white settlement, it was um, it was part of uh, uh, Nunawal country, uh, which which um, I guess the nation starts at the southern part of what is now the ACT and goes sort of north uh, through to sort of Lake George and across to Yass. Um, after white settlement, uh, that became uh, a sheep station of a few thousand. Acres and it was grazed um, in a sort of conservative set stocking way for for most of the the, the, the remaining 180 years, um, and it was only in 2000 that um, that the farm was broken up through a succession debacle, um, and and uh, the, the 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 current lot um, was purchased and developed. And your expectation now, you know, when you use the metaphor of a, you know, a dull ache, uh, my diagnostic skills come up here and I'm thinking of a chronic long-term problem. This isn't something that just came up overnight. Um, so, so what were you expecting to do before you read this book? Oh, look, I think, you know, if, 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 I, look, if I look at the things that um, were in some ways symptoms of my restlessness it was things like needing to do things with my hands and in a corporate job that's really quite difficult you know because you're pushing a pen or you know typing keyboards and in meetings and things like that and so there was a there was a, a dull frustration that that I, that I wasn't able to sort of create and 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 and, and do things physically uh, with my body um, and so when we're in Hong Kong, for example, which is, you know, it's, it's, that's a, that's a city which is very hard to, to do things other than work. Uh, you know, I pick up things like photography. Um, and, and so I, you know, I piled myself into photography. And I guess I, when I look back at some of these, you know, hobbies, so to speak, that they've always been um, things which have led me to sort of try and find an outlet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and it's been these outlets which have given me the, the, the signals that, that um, I need to do something more. And it's interesting too because, yes, we have had the pleasure of interviewing, um, of having uh, Charlie Massey on the program and like yourself, uh, I also read The Call of the Reed Warbler and was very moved by it. But I didn't step out and and uh, buy a farm and... <laughs> and not only buy a farm, but then actually ring Charlie up and say, "I need help." Uh, so that that process is what a great what a great story. Because and this is what I loved about it because many farmers have read Charlie's book and similarly had an epiphany, a life changing event, having had generations of farming history behind them. Mm. But you came at it as a newbie, and what a what a you really lucked out, lucked, lucked in, or lucked out there. That was that was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I guess I you know I I had a bit of front, I guess, in calling him up, but I I, I really was desperate. Um, I I panicked at that point, and um, you know it was interesting when when I spoke to him, he 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 almost immediately said, "Put your wife on." Yes, I remember you telling me this, and that was um, my next question. Go on. Yeah, yeah. This. Well, he he yeah you know, he really wanted to understand, uh, in a, in a sort of a regenerative sense, are you in this together? 
um, yeah. because this cannot be a pursuit of one. It, it, these are these are partnerships, and you will you will need each other. Um, th this is this is not an easy path to go down. And um, so so you know it was it was interesting to me that that he was more interested in in some of these alignments before he even started to talk about um, the farm. And uh, and then the second reason he he said I, he said I will help you because. Uh, you're, you're not from five generations of farmers. And, and, and he said, I'm just, I find it very, very difficult uh, to convert some of these intergenerational um, agricultural um, families uh, to a, a more regenerative um, uh, farming practices. Yes, you were kind of a blank slate. Yes, almost yeah. too good to refuse. <laughs> but, but which, which has its, which has you know obviously pluses, uh, but the the negatives are are also clearly there because the learning curve is very steep. Hmm. You know, you're, you're learning not only the the basics um, of of any agricultural business, but but you are then learning um, all of Charlie's approaches at the same time. So so it has been a a very steep hill to climb. Mm. And the other thing that, I, I mean, you know, you've come from the corporate world and uh, change management is a very popular concept within the corporate world. You know, it's always, we're always being confronted by change professionally, whether it's in law or dentistry or whatever. And, and you must have been, as I am, intrigued by change management within the farm setting. Yeah, look, I think... Um... Because a lot of people you've come into contact with are fifth generational farmers, aren't definitely, they? Definitely, definitely. And, and and some are, and some aren't. What are some of the impediments to change there? What do you what do you see? Some of those. You know, some of the some of the uh, things are um, when 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 you've got your father or your grandfather um, still in and and still engaged in what you're doing. Having that pressure of family looking over your shoulder, and if you know, it's very hard to try different things when, when you might be going against the grain of, you know, maybe even a century of, of particular practices. Because what you're really saying is, um, you know, dad or granddad, you, you're doing it, you, you, you've been doing it wrong, and I'm, I'm going to go and try something else. That's really, that's really quite other big impediment is that the whole system is geared to to to, to supporting um, the status quo if you think about the big chemical companies agricultural chemical companies for example I mean that they, they they exist um, because of depleted soils and de depleted landscapes because the more depleted they are the more you need uh, the, the the chemicals um, to to to, um, to to put into them so uh, you know, agronomists, um, uh, stock feeds, um, stock supplements, um, all of these things, they're all geared to maintaining the status quo. And then even on the cell side, once you become part of the food system and you look at how food, which is, you know, beautifully crafted by a farmer, a, a lot of that ends up becoming a commodity product that goes into a big system. And that system starts with transport and then it goes through sale yards and then it goes through abattoirs and then it goes through distribution and out into supermarkets. That, that system is absolutely geared to maintaining status quo. So, so it's a very conservative industry and, it, and, it, and there are, there, despite the winds of change and, and that, that there's some really positive changes coming through, we're starting off a low base, I think it's fair to say. Mm. <clears throat> now, having read Charlie's book, of course, but not having had a farm, I'm just kind of trying to imagine his first few, you know, like as he comes on there and what was some of what were some of the first things that, that were were on the agenda for you as you looked around the farm together? Well, one of the things that one of the things that uh, when I when I spent time with him. He has almost supernatural observation powers. He he has an unbelievable knack of seeing things in a landscape which which most people can't see because you're not landscape literate at that point. Mm. All I all I could see was bush, 
And then what he could see is, is literally hundreds of individual components and, and how they all interplay and that biodiversity and then the landscape function. And it was a, that really opened my eyes um, as to the powers of observation. And, and, you know, he said this is absolutely a, a critical skill that you need to learn. You, 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 you can't move forward unless you spend a lot of time observing and understanding what you're seeing. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise. Um, one of the, I mean, his whole master plan for us was about restoring landscape function. It's, it's, it wasn't really about building a productive farm at that point because the landscape is highly modified. Um, it, 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 even though it's in a pristine um, condition with respect to historical um, lack of chemical inputs, it's still a, a leached old environment um, which has been overcleared. Um, it has, you know, particular erosion and other sort of issues to do that require attention. So, so the whole thing was about how do you design a farm that um, that allows you to restore landscape function to create greater biodiversity and to, at the same time, design an enterprise where it's sufficiently stacked or diversified that it allows you to make better choices in relation to the landscape rather than having all of your bets in one monocrop or one monoculture. Mm. I can just, I just kind of put myself in your place there and as I have fantasised myself about buying land, and I can imagine you standing on your farm just as you and your wife have decided, yeah, let's do this. What a beautiful piece of land. What a great place we've got here. Let's go for it. There you are there with your signature on the contract, and now you're standing there with Charlie Massey making these observations about the landscape. Were they well aligned, those two visions? <laughs> no. No, not at all. No. Um, <laughs> How did your uh, perception of the landscape change? Well, well, I distinctly remember um, there was there was um, one of the more sort of seminal moments for us uh, with our time with Charlie uh, was it was a time where he and I had been doing some work, and it was late afternoon. It was a cold, late May, I think it would have been freezing cold day and uh, the sun was kind of quite low and we, we had pulled up um, in in this little sort of ATV buggy that we have and and we, we're just kind of, you know, he's a man of relatively few words, but the words he uses are pretty powerful. And uh, after a few minutes, he turned to me and he said, Murray, he said, you realise you don't own this place? And straight away, my mind went, well, hang on a second, I've, I've very recently signed <laughs> A title deed here, and 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 I didn't quite get what he was on about. And he said, he said, look, Murray, he said, see this sedimentary shale here, this rock. He said, this this is a, between three hundred and four hundred million years old. He said, see this river red gums here, two hundred and fifty to three hundred years old. This this landscape was here for hundreds of thousands of years before you came, and he said. If you think about how long you've got left on this planet, and you know, heaven for us a long time from now, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a very short time. And he just left it at that, and and it it, it, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. It it was a what he was really saying was you are merely passing through here. You are just a custodian for a very short period of time. So forget owning it, and start thinking about what you're going to be doing in terms of passing it on. Uh, and and I'll, I'll never forget that because it, it, it really kind of shook me and um, we made a bunch of decisions uh, in, the, in the months and years after that that, uh, that all trace back to that one conversation. Mm. Which was another area of us meeting that intrigued me and you've used the word custodians and we are now rather belatedly as Australian residents, you don't even have to be a citizen, you just have to be on this <clears> land <throat> to realise that there were people here for now, we're hearing 120,000 years, uh, you know, and um, the custodians of the land we pay, we acknowledge, 
but you've taken it a little step further there. Tell us how what you've done. So I guess the epiphany for us was uh, if it's only taken Australia 200 odd years to, to make a real mess of the land and you know, maybe that's harsh for some city folk to, to contemplate, but I can assure you, tr- travelling the length and breadth of Australia, uh, European settlement on, on this country has been severely degrading. Um, you know, it's not just land clearing, it's land use, it's water use, um, it, it, it's all of those things. And if, if that's only taken us 200 years to do, and if we are to be turning our minds to how do we regenerate that land, it really does feel odd that First Nations people are not part of that conversation. How can it possibly be that that 100,000 years of, of, of regenerative, sustainable uh, cultivation of this landscape and, the, and the, the ancestral knowledge that that has, but more than that, the the spiritual connection with with land and, and the mental mindscape of how to approach a landscape with sympathy, how is it that they're not part of the modern regenerative agriculture scene? And 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 so we, Michelle and I, said to ourselves, we we can't stand by and allow this to 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 to, to be. We 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 have to see what we could do individually as a family to put it, to put First Nations people into our lives as we go about regenerating landscapes. And so after a long search, we found uh, an Indigenous custodian from, from this particular area whose ancestral um, family comes from the land that we um, are now looking after. And we've built a relationship with him over a couple of years and we have now got to the point. Um, I'm cutting a very long story short, but no, we I, think, I think it's a really good story, one that we need, <laughs> we all need to be hearing. That's one of the. I mean, you go on. It's not. Yeah. Long. Don't apologise for being long because this is an important story. <laughs> well, this is an important story. Thank you, thank you. We, we have got to the point where we felt that it was, um, it was important for us to, to share our land. Uh, with with um, Girua or Port Paul and his and his people, um, we got to that point because of the relationship we had with him. We saw with our own eyes just how emotional he becomes when he's on his ancestral land. We got to that point because of the nurturing that he gave us. Uh, in a in a sort of semi spiritual sense to to sort of be our north star, in, and guiding us in relation to how we should think about things, and we got to that point because, you know, if I call a spade a spade, um, we, we we sit in a privileged position. If you think about freehold land in Australia, it's 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 owned by people like me. Uh, it's not owned by people like Paul. And um, the, the 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 dislocation and the disadvantage um, that that has been caused over many many years um, seems to be still mired in politics and in and in ever ever increasing circles of you know going nowhere. Um, and we just felt that it was important to put a line in the sand and say, you know what. We can we we can't change the national agenda, but what we can do is we can we can show a bit of leadership um, by sharing our farm with Paul. So we've constructed a partnership between us, uh, which is governed by Aboriginal law, not not by uh, white persons' law, um, and and so for for as long as we are here at Nuru, um, Paul, Paul and his people are welcome to uh, c- come and create an Aboriginal enterprise here um, so that they can have the same benefit that I have in terms of a place to express ourselves um, and that we can, through this partnership, 
show other people that there is so much to gain from this and so little to lose. Hmm. There's a certain irony here, Murray, isn't it, that your background is in corporate law and you have just said this is based on not white man's law but Indigenous First Nations law. How do you characterise that difference? Giving so, us a real, real legal advice, opinion, yeah, here, a valuable legal opinion here. <laughs> well, I How guess... you characterise the difference? Yeah, I guess um, law, 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 if you think about LAW, um, is a you know a, a set, sort of a very clear black and white set of set of laws and a and an executive and a Westminster system that at least how that works in Australia, um, but it's but it's defined by what you can and can't do um, in a very black and white way. And when I thought about how could we how could we um, put this partnership together, it it, it immediately felt at odds with what we were trying to create. How, how could you possibly do a land sharing agreement um, in this way when, when you know, everything about LAW um, has driven us to this point? Uh, by comparison, uh, First Nations law or L-O-R-E is more about a set of principles in, enshrined in a culture. And those principles are ancient principles which people live by. And the principle that we've chosen to construct this partnership under is called Yinjimara, which means uh, to be patient, to go slow, and to respect all things. And so I guess, um, you know, that that just that as a model just felt, felt right for us, and, and um, uh, that's where we've ended up. Mm. It's interesting also because I have heard uh, Charlie Massey talk about <clears throat> taking exception with the word sustainable because uh, what are we sustaining? If we're sustaining what we've done to this land over 200 years and left it and, and kept it at this level, we'd be in trouble. It's the regeneration that's important. And the argument always goes, yes, well, people do change landscapes. The First Nations people changed this landscape too, and there's no question they did, but they did it in a sustainable way, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did, and it was it was um, you know it's it's it, I guess it's hard for people like us um, to truly understand the depth of feeling, the depth of um, how can I put it, it uh, Ron? This is this is like when we talk about landscapes. If, and if Paul was on this call, he, he would be saying to you that that's my mother. Yeah. Now that, you know, he, you, you don't damage your mother. You, 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 you hold her up and you do everything to look after that. Um, and yet for too long, we've seen landscapes as a, as a substrate upon which to derive an economic benefit. And, that economic benefit has come at tremendous cost, um, environmentally, socially, um, as well. So, so I, you look. I, I do think that probably what Aboriginal people have to offer above all else is to reset our minds in relation to our relationship with 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 uh, with, with Mother Nature. Because mm. it is a very a totemistic, is that the word? A to yes. You know, they, they <clears throat> as you say, the, every, every, when they look around the landscape, it is them, it is their family, their ancestors, and uh, that kind of respect is, is, a, is an important one, isn't it? <clears throat> it really is, it really is. Yeah. So where are you at now? Where is the farm? What are, what are you growing down there? I know you do some farm stays, and I'm, I'm going to, Hopefully one day come down and, and visit there. But um, tell us about what what the farm is. N n give me the pronunciation. Nuru. 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 Yeah. So Paul <coughs> Paul um, Paul chose that name for us. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a name which in Ngunnawal language means camp, okay. and the Yass River, which starts sort of at the back of Bra uh, Bungendore and ends up uh, in the Murrumbidgee River past Yass. It's, it's not a big river, but it's an important river in the sense that it's uh, in the heartland of Ngunnawal country. It's located probably about 15 to 20 minutes 
southwest of Lake George, uh, which was a, which is a very important part of um, this local area for for um, Aboriginal people, and um, it's it's uh, a place where there would have been down through the ages a lot a lot of Aboriginal camps, and so this is I guess a uh, a nod to to the fact that um, uh, we have a sort of a, a camp here of our own, um, and it also a bit of a nod to the fact that you know I guess we're all just passing through, we're all just camping in a way. Um, so <clears throat> what we're doing down here is we have a um, we have a beef cattle operation which is kind of split into two pieces. The first part is is trade cattle which we which we use as tools in the landscape. So we will bring them on when we have um, plenty of grass. Um, we will use those animals for their for their fertility, uh, for the building of soil, um, and then we will move them off the landscape um, at the right times. Um, and then we have a small uh, Belt of Galloway stud herd, uh, which we're breeding uh, animals for sale to small farms who who are who are looking for um, building you know starting studs of their own so it's so it's a so it's a beef um, operation um, we are really big into natural sequence farming so that's all about trapping and holding water in the landscape so we're doing a lot of broad acre landscape modification looking at sort of how can we build a more resilient farm um, you know climate change is going to be here with us um, uh, and and it's going to be more and more severe uh, before it um, hopefully levels off. Um, and so what we're trying to do is prepare the farm and prepare ourselves for for the inevitability of that. Um, and then, as you say, we have this um, uh, farm stay, which for us was a deliberate attempt, if you like, to create to to join those who are interested in better health, better living, better, um, you know, getting closer to nature, um, wanting to understand about uh, regenerative agriculture and, and, and I guess a little tourism venture, which, which um, creates a nice place to stay. Uh, and the purpose therefore was, was to create a stacked enterprise where in terms of the holistic business that, that part, which some people would say is not farming, <laughs> but that does allow us to make much better choices out there in the landscape because we're not have all of our eggs in that one basket. Um, we're not trying to um, make a living off off a couple of thousand sheep. Mm. And you are bringing people from the city to the to the farm and seeing firsthand what is going on and just sort of dipping a toe in. You used the term there, a natural sequence farming. And um, I know if a regular, my regular listeners would be familiar with the term regenerative agriculture, but just, uh, and that's natural sequence farming. Tell us a little bit about that. So this is the, um, this is the brainchild of a, a guy called Peter Andrews, who is um, one of Australia's, uh, I guess legends of um, of, uh, of 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 modern agriculture, but but you know in a sort of farming with nature kind of space. He he uh, he has developed over a half a century of of work a, a a body of understanding about how landscapes functioned before white settlement. And that's really important because Australia's landscape is significantly different to European landscapes. Our soils are old. Our flora and fauna is unique. The, the climate is unique. And so all of those things require a, an understanding of how it used to work because we can, if we're going to regenerate this landscape, we will have to do it in ways which, which, um, restore the function of the land before um, uh, European settlement. So what that really involves is, is looking for clues in the landscape as to where things used to be and how they used to be designed, and most in particular, the flow of water. How did that used to flow? And, of course, in Australia, 
a few centuries ago, a lot of the landscape used to be uh, chains of ponds, um, uh, sort of wetlands, swampy meadows. Water used to move slowly through the landscape. It was only in the big rivers that you would ever see moving water. And this was well documented by Australia's first um, explorers, where they would ride on horseback through the Australian um, East Coast, for example, and they would get wet legs from the dew and the water in the grasslands whilst on horseback. So we know that the landscape was was significantly hydrated. What's changed, of course, is that um, over the course of the last couple of hundred years, livestock being introduced to these quite sensitive environments has had a dramatic effect on dehydrating Australia's landscapes. And so to cut a very long story short, the, the, the essence of Peter Andrews' work is, is to try to restore uh, the function of the landscape and in particular uh, reversing the effects of fast-flowing water in a landscape. Slow the water down, let the plants grow, be careful where the animals go. These are these are sort of his core principles, and um, and we're 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 practicing them here. Because mm. I, I I note that you you bring some cattle onto a land to help restore the land, and that's actually counterintuitive to what most people would think occurs with animals, and it's why I think animals cop such a bad serve. You know, like we animals are the problem. Well, I, I know Alan Savory said they're not the problem; it's the way they're managed. You're managing them a little differently. How, how how does that work? Well, we 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 know that leaving animals in a large paddock to their own devices sends a landscape backwards. We know that because the the animals have free reign to go wherever they like and to eat whatever they like. And what they will tend to do is they'll destroy wet areas. They will trample on things they shouldn't trample on. Uh, they'll eat the preferential plants over the, the less desirable plants to the point that those preferential plants will collapse. And so you can see that leaving animals in a, in a landscape, what we call set stocking, has a, has a detrimental effect. What, what, what we need to be doing is moving animals with precision. We need to have... Uh, whether it's beef or, or, or sheep, we need to have them in s- contained in small areas for very short periods of time, and then we need to move them on. And so it's the combination of that high-intensity impact for a very short period of time, the, 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 the dump of manure and urine, and then the long rest period of that particular part of the land that creates the regeneration, that, that improves the soil profile, improves the, the ability of that soil to hold water. Animals managed in that way can transform a landscape from a degraded one into one which is absolutely uh, teeming with life. Conversely, if you toss them out into a big paddock and, and – uh, call them in after 12 months, you you are going to be sending the landscape backwards. And I think this it's fair to say that the majority of us, as we drive around the country and look out across uh, the highway and see these huge paddocks and the odd cattle or a bunch of cattle under a tree and then a few over there and that, that is the set stocking, which is, well, well, I guess the majority of of, uh, cattle are done like. Is, is, uh, Is that the majority? I think I think that's fair still. I think that's fair, but 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 um, I'm encouraged by, um, I mean, you know, uh, it's still a small part of um, Australia's food production system. But regenerative agriculture um, and the farmers who are practicing it are, are growing every day. Um, and you know, I would encourage um, your listeners to 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 seek out those farmers who, who are doing this. Um, there's lots of farmers all over Australia, um, within certainly within the supply chain of, of places like Sydney, hmm. 
who, who, who are farming with this sort of level of care and attention that allows um, you, the, the, the consumer to buy with confidence that the product coming off these landscapes is not only clean, because let's, let's be clear here, or, organic simply means non-poisoned. That doesn't mean that the landscape is necessarily being regenerated. But, but, but if you're buying something from, from a landscape that is being regenerated, then you can buy with confidence that, that the, the livestock that have, have created the food on your table have helped improve a landscape. And that's a really, really important point. Um, the, more, the more support farmers get for farming in this way, the more we will convert more and more set stocking into holistic cell grazing, timed grazing, which, which I've mentioned earlier. Mm. Well, Murray, I think that's a great note for us to finish on and, and a great message for us to pass on to our listener. It's certainly one that they're hearing quite a bit of on this podcast. And thank you so much for sharing your incredible story and journey and good luck on the, on the, in the future. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Ron. I've really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to, uh, to be on the call today. Now, isn't that a wonderful story? And I love the... Now, there's a corporate lawyer who redefines the word law and, okay, there's a little bit of word play there, but the law and the law, the LAW, the white man's law, very black and white, uh, very uh, straightforward. Well, actually not, but uh, that's another story. And there is the First Nations law, L-O-R-E, which pays a respect to the country in a way that is something we can all learn from. And I think we have so much to learn from our First Nations people. And that's a theme that I'm hoping to explore more in the weeks and months and years ahead. Um, Murray's Farm is, uh, we will have links to that, the Nguru, Nguru, N-G-W-W-U, R W um, uh, is the farm, and uh, I, I'm, we're definitely going to get down there and and spend a night or two with them and just have a look around and see what is going on. But what a great story! What an inspiring story, and not just a story of city folks moving to fulfil a dream by um, living on the land, but kickstarting it with uh, reading a book like The Call of the Reed Warbler and being mentored by Charlie Massey and making some really uh, powerful decisions about regenerating, not just sustaining, regenerating a land. It's worth mentioning that uh, science tells us that um, it takes nature 500 years to uh, grow, if you like, or lay down an inch or 2.5 centimetres of soil, 500 years. And we are losing soil at a phenomenal rate. I've heard one um, estimates say we only have six har 60 harvests left because soil is being degenerated at such a, a rate. Regenerative agriculture, using animals as they should be used, ruminants as they should be used in tight packs in a small area for a short period of time and then moving them to the next paddock and allowing that paddock that they were on to rest for two or three months a well-managed regenerative farm can grow one inch or 2.5 centimetres of soil in three to five years. So please, let, whenever anybody tells you that animals are the problem, I refer you back to that wonderful conversation I had with Alan Savory, who said animals are not the problem. In fact, resources are not the problem. It is the way they are managed. And uh, regenerative agriculture is a very important part of that story. And so is First Nations law, L-O-R-E, the respect that they have had for the land in maintaining it in a sustainable fashion for now, it used to be thought 65,000 years, the figure went up to 85,000 years. I heard Bruce Pascoe recently and posted about it that it's now standing at 120,000 years. Well, really, whether we're talking 65,000 or 120,000, the point is, in 200 years, we have degenerated this land to such a point that there are only 60 harvests left. So um, that, that I found was a very powerful uh, message. And interestingly, I was also interested to hear Murray's take on what is resisting to change. 
And this is uh, two things he identified. Uh, one is past history with your parents and grandparents, perhaps either physically or metaphorically looking over your shoulder. Sometimes change is seen as a rejection of the past. And I think it's about framing how change occurs. It's not a rejection of the past. It's a building on the past to propel us into the future. So I don't think we should shy away from change. And uh, and that's a theme we're going to be repeatedly exploring on this program. The other one is systems, the systems that are in place, the chemical and the marketing uh, industries that are built up around this form of industrial agriculture that actually places farmers at the uh, in a more vulnerable position. And ultimately, what I love about regenerative agriculture and what I love about the messages of the people that I've spoke, had the privilege of speaking to is that this is about building resilience into the land and in doing so, building resilience into the farmers and farming families that live on that land. And I think that's a really important theme that, that we all need in the city to be supporting. I've said this before, we get to vote once every three or four years, but we get to vote every single day with the money, we, the way we spend our money. And we know money talks. So let's make a talk in a really positive way that's not just good for our health and not just good for the health of the animals and the plants that we're buying, but also the farmers that are growing it and the entire planet at the same time. A win, 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 win situation. What could be wrong with that? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's program. Uh, don't forget, we've got some great online programs available, the Unstress with Dr. Ron app. Dr. Ron Ehrlich app will keep you informed of those things. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.